I would like to pray first. So let, let us pray, okay? Lord, thank you for this time. We're studying your word. We know it's a spiritual event which takes your Holy Spirit to guide us in understanding your truth. We pray that you would that would provide through your spirit that help for us tonight as we look in your word. And thank you for the fact that it is the uh, it is truth that comes down from above. Pray that it's edifying to our lives, not just uh, to our minds. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Now, take your outline this week, and let's read in Daniel 2. And I'm going to promise you, we won't spend another week on Daniel 2. This is our last <laughs> go-around on this chapter, all right? But you can see how much information is in it. So let's read verses 24 and 25, and then let's talk about them. So Daniel 2, 24-25, says, Therefore Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and spoke to him as follows, Don't destroy the wise men of Babylon. Take me to the king's presence, and I will declare the interpretation of the king. Then Arioch hurriedly brought Daniel into the king's presence and spoke to him as follows. I found a man among the exiles of Judah who can make the interpretation known to the king. And then, of course, we might even include 26. The king answered and said to Daniel, whose name, whose name he named Belteshazzar, are you able to make known to me the dream which I have seen and its interpretation? And, of course, Daniel 27 answers uh, before the king and said, as for, as for the mystery about which the king has inquired, neither wise men, conjurers, magicians, nor diviners uh, are able to declare it. However, there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has made known to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, what will take place in the latter days. This was your dream and the visions in your mind while on your bed. Uh, and he says, as for you, O king, verse 29, as uh, while on your bed, your thoughts turn to what would take place in the future. And he who reveals mysteries has made known what will take place. So in other words, clearly, Nebuchadnezzar was concerned about what was going to happen. Undoubtedly about his own kingdom. But he was concerned about it. He was troubled about it. And God gives him this very unique vision, which, of course, is both not understandable to him, that is, it, it, it shocks him, it amazes him, and, of course, he, he needs to know the answer. Now, notice, let, let's also read here uh, 30 through, I think, uh, 35, and then we're going to talk about this. He says, As for me, this mystery has not been revealed to me for any wisdom residing in me more than any other living man, but for the purpose of making the interpretation known to the king that you may understand the thoughts of your mind. Okay? Because he didn't know what the heck this meant. And it really impressed him, and he really wanted to know. So he says, You, O king, were looking, and behold, it was a single great statue, that statue which was large and of extraordinary splendor, was standing in front of you, and its appearance was awesome. In other words, he was pretty small compared to what he saw. The head of that statue was made of fine gold, its breast or the chest and its arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You continued looking until a stone was cut out without hands, and it struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and crushed them. Then the iron and clay and the bronze and the silver and the gold were crushed all at the same time and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them was found. But the stone that struck the statue became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This was the dream, and now we shall tell its interpretation to the king. So, 
let's focus on these legs of iron and feet partly of iron and partly of clay. That's the part we really didn't cover last week. In other words, this represents the fourth kingdom, which of course we call the Roman Empire. It was initially extremely strong. I mentioned to you, of course, the ethic of uh, the Roman Empire, Empire, which was called the Pax Romana, the Roman peace. It was facilitated by absolute brute force. It was f facilitated by many, many, many legions of Roman military that would occupy these countries that they took over and force the Roman peace. And if you dared violate it, you were dead, okay? As I said before, there is no empire that we know of that caused more slavery and sold more people into slavery than the Roman Empire. It was brutal military dictatorship that, that didn't utilize, really, the people it conquered, but just crushed them under its boot different from the way the Medes operated, different from the way Babylon operated, different from the way Greece operated also. But even though it had a very large empire that covered nearly entirely what Alexander had covered in his 11-year conquests, virtually, of course, to the Indus Valley of India, due to several factors, it also became very brittle and fragmented. And as you said, Anushka, immigration was one of the things that brought it down because the empire became so vast, as you said, that there were not enough Italians to possibly recruit into the military to cover this entire huge empire. So therefore, to try to manage it, they had to recruit other peoples in with the promise, I think the way they did it is if you served 20 years in the military and you survived, you became, <laughs> you became a Roman citizen. But you could also, as a result, if you were a Roman citizen, then, of course, your children became Roman citizens also, et cetera, et cetera, all right? So the problem with that is they, they, they gained the manpower of the military through it, but what did they also cause? Who... Right. Who was going to be as loyal as the Italians? No one. Nobody. So it became a mixed problem. You, know, you had Syrian uh, troops. You had, you know, uh, you know, uh, Turkish troops. You had. I mean, you had all these different troops that the primary loyalty where they grew up was not certainly to Italy. They'd never been to Italy. Most of them. You know. So this became a problem. Also, of course, other things occurred. We see the constant devaluation of their, of their money. You know, they started out, of course, with a gold coin, which became smaller and smaller, which then they issued silver coins, which became smaller and smaller. Then, of course, bronze coins, and eventually they get down to, you know, other, you know, like oh, iron coins, because, of course, why? Because to run this empire caused enormous debt. They are always trying to produce more money to pay all these troops, to run the government systems, to manage it. And of course, it was it essentially became an impossibility, you know, and therefore caused a decline. Also, there was vast corruption in the system, as usually occurs in big systems, mismanagement of money, people stealing it as government officials. And of course, uh, you know, all these ethnic peoples and all these difficulties led to a split in the empire. The West, uh, we'll talk about that in a second, uh, was one side, but there was an eastern side, okay? And the eastern side occurred as a result of Constantine in approximately 320 making a capital in the east, which was uh, originally Byzantium, in Turkey, he renamed it Constantinople, and he became the emperor of the eastern side. There were still emperors of the western side. Eventually, the western side 
really kind of merged to a great extent with the Roman Catholic Church and was called then later the Holy Roman Empire, okay? The Eastern side merged with, the orth with what we call today the Orthodox churches, okay, and became, uh, 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 had its own system. Um, now, what we see here, of course, is that uh, it, this demonstrates the fact that there's no way to truly unify the system. The iron, quote, can't alloy with the clay. And, of course, the empire becomes less and less unified and more and more brittle. Mm -hmm. Now, we also see here that eventually another kingdom emerges after this fourth, which is entirely different from the previous four. Why? What's the statement that's made about it? It is not formed by with human effort. In other words, it's an empire not of this world, mm -hmm. but rather it is an empire that comes from down from above. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, where it says that? Uh, in the, the what? Oh, in the paper. In the outline, or you talk about the verse? Uh, it says. Um, Yeah, where is it? Go back and look. Uh, no. No, not right verses. No, it's. Uh, okay, it says you continue looking, verse thirty-four, until a stone was cut without hands, mm -hmm. and it struck the statue wow. on its feet. And notice where it strikes it. It doesn't strike it initially in its head. It doesn't strike it on its abdomen. It doesn't strike it in its, in its thighs. stronger. No. No. It's because when this kingdom strikes, what's left? The feet with iron and clay. The others have passed. So there's a remnant. Yeah, there's a remnant, therefore, of this feet of iron and clay that's still somehow around and it strikes it and look and of course it crushes it pulverizes it mm -hmm. and then as a result of that then it also pulverizes the gold and the silver and the bronze mm -hmm. and the iron legs as you see in verse 35 of chapter 2 and then finally this the striking stone okay eventually grows into this huge mountain which fills, quote-unquote, the entire earth. So, um, um, now, last week we covered the meaning of the first four kingdoms, which we reiterated tonight. Now let's focus more closely on the iron and clay. Look, for instance, uh, at an important element here. And it is found in. Well, we're starting. I'm starting. I've finished B, and I'm going into number two, starting in A. Okay. Now, in verse four, let's read verses 40, 41, 42, and 43, because this is, becomes extremely interesting, particularly for us in this age. Starting 40, but there will be a fourth kingdom as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron crushes and shatters all things, so like iron that breaks into pieces, it will crush and break all these into pieces. In that, you saw the feet and the toes. Now, he's now introducing and having you focus on these toes. Mm -hmm. Okay, how many would there be? Ten. Ten. In that you saw the toes, the feet and the toes, partly of potter's clay, partly of iron, it will be a divided kingdom, but it will have in it the toughness of iron inasmuch as you saw the iron mixed with common clay. Verse 42, and as, and as the toes of the feet were partly iron and partly clay or pottery, so some of the kingdom will be strong and part of it will be brittle, in verse 43, in, in that you saw the iron mixed with common clay, they, Mark underlined that, they will combine with one another in the seed of men, 
that they will not adhere to one another, even as iron does not com combine with pottery. And we'll, we'll stop right there for the second, okay? Now let's talk about this. So we started with two legs, that is the kingdom of Rome, empire of Rome, that were never truly completely defeated by another human empire. The West deteriorated, as we said. It merged eventually with the Catholic Church and became, as I said, the Holy Roman Empire. Finally, it split into separate nations with their own kings and eventually became, over time, what we would call medieval Europe. It was still highly influenced. It still had the ethnicities of the original empire, but it wasn't the original empire. It devolved or evolved into something different, but still had qualities of the original empire. Mm -hmm. Make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Now, the eastern side, of course, also devolved from how Constantine instituted it. It merged significantly with the Orthodox churches, and it lasted until about 1204 A.D., okay, and it's called the Byzantine Empire, and you can look up the Byzantine Empire. Now, it's interesting because it had a long list of emperors that ruled it literally from Constantine all the way through around 1200 or so A.D. Some were strong, some were weak. And this eastern side went through cycles of decline and rebuilding. But again, it really wasn't formally conquered by another empire but eventually was partly absorbed or dominated by the Ottoman Empire. You understand what the Ottoman Empire was? No. That's the is Islamic Empire. Muslim. That's the Muslims, who started with Muhammad, became a military force by around 700 AD, and of course became more dominant, more dominant, more dominant. So Muhammad was a real person? Of course. Mm -hmm. He was. Yeah. Quote unquote. Okay? Although, if you read the story of Muhammad, you'll find some very interesting things about him. We're not going to go into that right now. Yes. Okay. I'm in B. Okay. Now, all right, so we see this This is how these things, they, they had an original quality of Rome, but they changed. They weren't identical to it. They, they kind of evolved from it, but the nature of it, the customs of it, and elements of it still continued. Does that make sense? Follow? Yeah. Okay. Now, last week we saw, I proposed to you the first prophetic meaning of the iron, both of mixed uh, with clay. Okay, the fact that it, there couldn't, it couldn't be an alloy, a proper alloy. And, of course, what we talked about was the immigration issue, that as more and more people came into the empire, especially in the western side, the Germanic tribes, the French tribes, you know, the, uh, the Britain tribes, as those people came in, they came in at one point about 400 A.D. in mass. They kind of flooded into the empire. And the empire was weak enough, it had no way to really deal with them effectively. And of course, it just weakened it further, uh, and, and, uh, and that's what happened to that side. So part of the prophetic meaning of this was fulfilled by the immigration around 400 AD on the western side. Now, but there's other, I think, prophetic fulfillments of this too. Now, in verses 41 and 42, we see these ten toes having this brittle aspect of iron mixed with clay. In verse 44, it makes an interesting statement, and let's read it. In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed, and that kingdom will not be, not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, but itself will endure forever. Now, 
In verse 43, it just got done talking about, in 42, about the toes. That's the focus of the discussion there. So it's saying, all right, that in the days of those kings, so what therefore apparently are those ten kings? Those toes? Ten kings. Ten kings. It's equating the toes with ten kings. Mm -hmm. But do you see any example of this either on the western or eastern side of the empire historically? No. No. You can't find ten kings, mm -hmm. okay, particularly that ruled at the same time, the entire empire. So therefore, it has to be a prophetic fulfillment that's going to occur because that's describing something that hasn't occurred yet. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. All right. So it's saying that the toes represent kings that will emerge, that will rule in a way much like this fourth kingdom and share aspects with this fourth kingdom. Make sense? Mm -hmm. All right. Now, if you were a prophecy student in the 1920s and 1930s, okay, you would read this and you would say to yourself, what the heck does this mean? It would be extremely difficult to interpret it because certain events hadn't occurred by which you could interpret it. So it would be a complete mystery to you what it was going to mean. But in 1948, one element of it starts, which starts to make a whole lot of sense to you. Because now Israel's back in its own in its own traditional homeland. You go, oh, Israel's back, as was promised by Ezekiel, as is promised by other prophets. Then we have some other events that started to happen. In 1957, there was something called the Treaty of Rome. Do you know what the Treaty of Rome was? The Treaty of Rome set up the framework for what we call the European Common Market. It set up this legal economic framework, and it started to admit nations into this market. And after a number of years, there were 10 of them. Okay? Yes. And the prophet students said, this is it. We have 10 nations. This is the fulfillment of the ten toes. Mm -hmm. But there was a problem, because then you had the eleventh nation, and the twelfth nation, and the thirteenth nation, and the fourth, and now we have twenty-eight of them. Well, there aren't twenty-eight toes, are there? Okay? Mm -hmm. So therefore, what was thought to be the fulfillment then, apparently had an aspect of it, but it wasn't the, really the fulfillment. Then... In 1992, we had the Treaty of Euro the Treaty of the European Union. That's what it's called, 1992 Treaty of the European Union, which set up the legal framework for the European Union and admitted states, which again today number 28, all in the same geography of the ancient Roman Empire. True? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. You mean the Western part? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, biblical prophecy scholars, when this started happening, went crazy with excitement. As all the pieces seemed to be together, just waiting for a future ruler, Antichrist, to show up. Okay? And if you read during the 70s and 80s and 90s, prophecy scholars said, the Roman Empire has been revived. Just like the book of Daniel said in chapter 2, we'll now have the pieces here. And Antichrist will soon come. Now. There were a lot of people even predicting. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. That he was on earth. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Except something interesting happened again. Whoops. Okay. Several years ago, an event started to occur. I'm now in E. Europe needed more cheap labor because of their vastly declining birth rate. And they, became a, and they developed a massive immigration prob, program of African and Middle Eastern Muslims. Okay. Um, right? Okay. That's what we see going on today, isn't it? We see Germany. We see Belgium. We see, you know, not all of them are taking in. Poland's resisting. Bulgaria, I believe, is resisting. There's some in the Far East that are resisting. Switzerland, Switzerland is resisting. France is not. Germany is not, Spain is not, Portugal is not, 
And now we have a massive immigration of, 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 of peoples that are Semitic peoples, that are Muslim peoples, into Europe. Now, there's a problem here. Again, remember what's just said in verses 42 and 43. The toes of the feet were partly of iron, partly of pottery. Uh, so the kingdom will be strong, part of it, and part of it brittle. And in it, you saw the iron mixed with common clay. And we're going to go through what 43 also means. The problem that Europe, of course, has found is they brought in all these different peoples of non-European stock genetically, right? Mm -hmm. But they won't acculturate to their host countries. Yeah. They will not acculturate. Europe thought they would culture, acculturate. Mm -hmm. Europe thought they would take on European values. They thought they would take on European economic principles. They thought they would buy into the political process. They thought they would merge, but they don't merge. Just like iron doesn't merge mm -hmm. with clay. All right. So just like in 400 AD with a massive immigration program that split the empire, Again, today, we have a massive immigration problem in the very same mm -hmm. empire in terms of the same area that is now splitting up Europe. And I will suggest to you that it's going to appreciably split apart in the next few years. Mm. It's going to be so brittle It's because what's happening? You know, people in Europe are getting sick of the crime rates mm -hmm the exponentially rising crime rates that are going on in their countries. And the size of the ghetto. Exactly. Mm -hmm. The Muslims, of course, form Muslim, you know, ghettos that they live in. They want to culturate with the people around. Then they take over a city area. They want their own police force. They don't want the Europeans involved. They want to establish Sharia law in that area. They set up their own Muslim economies there, okay? Like, for instance, in Sweden, if I remember correctly what I read not too long ago, there's 50 different cities in Sweden alone that they have zones that are essentially, they call them no-go zones because they're Muslim areas. Mm -hmm. The Swedish police won't even go into them. Yeah, the funniest thing is that the Europeans let them do all this. They let them do it all, okay? So they now have made their own union that they formed extremely brittle. Yeah. And when he did, he got Merkel and made it very clear, and she's in serious jeopardy. She is. And then if you look at what happened in England. Right, with Brexit? Yeah. Okay. You've got so many things that are relative to what you're teaching here that is going on today. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Because it is the prophetic, prophetic fulfillment of what these verses are saying. Mm -hmm. Again, every... Every so many years, the events that occur make the prophecy more focused and clear. So what you could understand 10 years ago, you can understand a lot more now, 10 years later. It focuses these events, okay? And now we see what's happening in this area. Now, so I believe that the European Union will eventually fragment. Very few prophecy scholars saw this event. They didn't see that history of the fragmentation of the empire was going to occur again in modern Europe. But that is what seems to be occurring. Okay, and if you read any of the books in the 80s and 90s, there was just no discussion of this because no one saw it coming. They thought that its form was here. But now we're seeing it's from, yes, go ahead, Jack. The, the Obama administration uh, objected to to change our country, and I wonder if that was part of it, to, to allow all this immigration. Of, of well, we, we have somewhat of our own immigration problem, but nothing compared this point to what's going on uh, in Europe. Because, you know, for instance, Britain is now 10% Muslim. Mm -hmm. It's actually more than that. Yeah, it's huge. I mean, and, and when you get enough people like that that then vote, who are they going to vote for? Mm -hmm. They're going to vote for Muslim candidates, and the government is going to be slowly taken over by Muslims. This is what's going to happen. 
they, they're not going to be able to stop this now because they've, they've had too many in and the process is rolling along. So you're either going to get a takeover, you're going to have the new Ottoman Empire of Europe, or you're going to have a civil war. So the point you're making is war. that Europe is now doing the same as Roman Empire. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Did one. Exactly. And rolling in the grace and which kind of controls it. And exactly. Now, here's the interesting point. Let's go one step further as we're looking at these you know, these toes in verse 42, 43, and 44. With the apparent increasing dissolution and fragmentation of the European Union, it will likely usher in a new form of global government. This is what I think is going to happen. It will probably, therefore, represent these ten toes, these ten kings. Now, you say, how's that going to happen? Well, it's very interesting because the United Nations, in their Agenda 21 document, referring to regional management goals for planet sustainability, said that the world needs to be set into 10 regional zones controlled by a world government entity, leader of each one of those regional zones, so that the planet can be environmentally safe, uh, you know, so the planet can be run efficiently, so that there isn't excessive population, yada, yada, yada. The UN already set a framework for the whole planet to be broken into 10 zones. They're both economic and political zones in the Agenda 21 document. So we have a basis to believe that this is going to occur with increased globalist movement. Haven't they had some meetings? Well, they've had lots of meetings. Matter of fact, they even have now an Agenda 2030, which even focuses this more. I was looking at those UN documents. I didn't pull them all out to give copies to you. But if you want to, if you want to find out more, just put in Agenda tw UN Agenda 2030 or Agenda 21 Wikipedia. It'll give you a great summary of what of what they're saying. Agenda 21. Yeah, Agenda UN UN. United Nations Agenda 21 and UN United Nations Agenda 2030. They're two different policy documents. They're 2030. 2030 also. Now, interestingly, the Bible's telling us this is going to happen. Turn to Daniel 7. We're only going to look at a couple verses because I don't want to spend too much time on 7, and we're trying to finish up chapter 2, but let's, let's read 23, 24, and 25 of Daniel 7. Are you there? Mm -hmm. yeah. Thus he said, the fourth beast will be a fourth kingdom on the earth, which will be different from all other kingdoms, and it will devour the earth and tread it down and crush it. The earth. Okay? Okay. I'm on reading 23. 24. That you understand, this can't, the way it just described it, this can't be the European Union. It has to be something after it, because the European Union is not crushing the whole earth. Right? But there's going to be a government that's going to occur. It's going to be like it, but different from it, that has these ten kings. Verse, verse 24. As for the ten horns, out of this kingdom, ten kings will rise. Then another will rise after them, and he will be different from the previous ones. And we're going to show you why he may be different. Underline the word different there. Keep it in mind. He will be different from the previous ones and will subdue three, three kings. And he, verse 25, he will speak out against the Most High and wear down the saints of the highest one, and he will intend to make alterations in times and law, and they will be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. That is, one unit, two units, and half a unit. That is, three and a half years. This describes Antichrist. He will emerge from the ten kings. Different from the ten kings will 
do away somehow with three of them, depose them, and then take over the whole global system. Mm -hmm. So I think what we're looking towards... Different men in genetically? We'll get there. <laughs> Hold on, we'll get there, okay? What we're looking for then is to see if there's, a, if there's enough global movement, okay, that occurs that eventually there's an outcry for this implementation of this global government system of 10 regions and 10 leaders. And when that occurs, we see it occurring, you know Antichrist is not far away. Okay? Make sense? All right, now, there is another fulfillment, I believe, prophetically, in these toes. Okay? Are we going backwards? Well, let's, I'm in G now in your outline. And we're, again, let's, let's read again verse 43 in Daniel 2. This I find to be extremely interesting. You have to dig around a little bit here in the language to pick it out. But let's read it in English, verse 43. In that you saw the iron mixed with common clay, they combined with one another, in the seed of men, That's isn't it? Mm -hmm. But they will not adhere to one another, even as iron does not combine with pottery. Hmm. Now you go, what does that mean? Well, well let's, let's go back to uh, Genesis 6. We are, absolutely. <laughs> My students speak that. All right. Now, the Aramaic word for clay is kashaf. And it means, interestingly, now think about what it means. To peel something from something else or to strip away from. Notice how it says they won't bond together, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. All right, they won't alloy with each other. Mm -hmm. Now, it's interesting because we have a very similar Hebrew word we find in Exodus 16, 14, which talks of or speaks of the peeling of manna from where it was deposited each morning. Same word, okay? To take away from, to peel from. Manna, of course, was different from the ground area that it was formed on, so it had to be taken away from it. This is also the same word. There's another interesting word here, too. We read that, quote, they, which is a plural pronoun, right, they, means of people, some type of people, will combine in the, quote, seed of men. The Aramaic word for seed is zera, which means offspring, reproduction, or in its most literal sense, semen. All right? So it implies that the offspring biologically that occurs does not combine well and does not combine permanently. Now, you might say to yourself, well, could that be speaking about the immigration process in Europe where there's, there's intermarriage between the Muslims and, for instance, the European, genet, the, the genetic Europeans? But it can't mean that. Why? Why can it not mean that? They do mix. Because they do mix. Every genetic ethnic group mixes. Okay? You don't find any human beings on the face of the earth that can't reproduce with other human beings. Right? They all mix. So it can't mean that. It has to mean something different. All right? Now, in, uh, one, um, what else could this mean? Now, I want you to turn, you, hold, you can hold here, but I want you to turn to Matthew 24. Because Jesus says what I find to be a very alarming thing. It's, if you think about what he's saying, it's, it's unbelievable what he's saying. We're going to read 36 to 39. Now, what's he talking about? The signs of the end. He goes through all these different signs that will characterize the end of the age before his return, right? So 
here's one of the last things he talks about. 36 through, let's read 36, 37, 38, 39, Matthew 24. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son of Man, but the Father alone. In other words, the very day he will come to the earth. He's describing the age that no one knows the day that he will return. Okay. So all the prophecies that will happen on 12, 12, 12, well, that's <laughs> Okay. <laughs> now, look at what he's saying, though, verse 37. For the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. Mm -hmm. you know, why, why does he say this? Why is he equating it with the days of Noah? For in those days which were before the flood, look at the word he uses, they okay, were eating and drinking, and they were marrying and given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they did not, another, did not understand until the flood came and took them away. So will the coming of the Son of Man be. So who's the they he's referring to here? The Nephilim and the Gibberim. That's the they. Now what are they? How, how do we know that, that Nephilim but not let's say, corrupted people. Well, what corrupted people? That's, that, that's not the emphasis of G Genesis 6. The emphasis is not what human beings are doing. It's what the Gibrim and the Nephilim are doing to human beings. And They're corrupting they the gene pool, correct? What are the Gibrim? The Gibrim. The Nephilim are a direct genetic combination of a fallen angel and a human. Right. And then when the when they then have another sexual union with another human, Their okay, is the, all the offspring after them are called the Gibberim. Okay? So in the days of Noah, the reason for the flood was a hybrid problem. Right? Mm -hmm. It was a hybrid problem. Mm -hmm. That the fallen angels were literally trying to destroy the, junk, the human genome. There would be no pure human genome. Now, why would they do that? What would be their purpose? Well, the, so there wouldn't be a, a Messiah that without sin. Exactly. It's prophesied Genesis 3.15 that there'll be a woman who will have a son who will be, we call Messiah, mm -hmm. who will then do in, okay, Satan. So you have to have a human genome to pass down that's completely human, right? Therefore, the only true hybrid that God allows in all of this, interestingly enough, is Jesus Christ. <laughs> right. Because what is he? He's God and man. He's the only proper hybrid. There's only one that's allowed to be a hybrid. That's the Son of God who comes to the earth. So you're saying that they will combine with one another in the seed of man, but they will not appear to right. one another. Saying about hybrid? What happens eventually to the Nephilim and their offspring, the Gibraim, on the earth? God destroys them. God destroys them. Their bodies die in the flood. They drown. But their, their, their demonic spirit is trapped on the earth, mm -hmm. okay? And what do we call these entities trapped on the earth? Demons. The demons. The demons are not fallen angels, okay? Mm -hmm. All right, they got locked away in the abyss, but they are the remnant of this offspring, offspring mm -hmm. okay? And they're, they have a dissoluted existence. They don't have a body anymore, mm -hmm. okay? And they're, and they're trapped on the earth. They can't get away. That's what we call demons. And like the demons are just people that uh, uh, Jesus cast them out. What do they want? They, they want a body. 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 They want to possess a body. Why did he let them go into the pigs and see what was going on? Well, number one, he can't destroy them because everyone's eternal and they're just going to reside somewhere. 
The demons are eternal. The fallen angels are eternal. We're eternal. No one is annihilated, right? But you're either going to be in the heaven in the heavens with the Lord in the New Jerusalem, or you're going to be in hell with Satan, the false prophet, the Antichrist, all the demons, and all the fallen angels. Well, Steve is unclean animal, so the pigs ran into the water and drowned, and the demons came out of them. Exactly. Well, it was kind of a. Why take the pigs? Well, they're unclean. They're an unclean animal. They, okay. On the one hand, I think. On the other hand, I think, frankly, Jesus was tricking them. They cry out, you know, "Don't send us to the abyss," and he goes, "All right." Go to the pigs. So what happens? The pigs go crazy as they enter them, drown them right back where they were before. <laughs> so Jesus, <laughs> so nice thing, okay. Okay. Wait a minute before you go on. Okay. So let's go back to the flood then. God knew what was going to happen, so it was only the bodies that were going to be destroyed, correct? Mm-hmm. It's not like it was a surprise to him then that that they lived continue to live as demons, right? Yes. Okay. Well, that's... What, yeah. Did you have a question? No, that, that was what I was asking, is that... Yeah. Now, again, you've got to get out of your mind when you read Genesis 6. There's nothing in there that emphasizes the corruption of man. What it emphasizes is the corruption of the original design of the world and humanity as the fallen angels invade and and then create this hybrid. And these hybrids are giants, okay? And it, sells, it says in Genesis 6 and verse 11 that they cause violence on the earth. It's they that cause the violence, okay? If you read Enoch you come up with some very interesting information, which I believe is, personally, I believe is accurate. Enoch tells you that the giants, of course, being very large, had to have a food source. What do you think their first food source was? Humans. Human beings. And then when enough of them weren't left, then they turned on each other, and they cannibalized each other. Mm-hmm. So, when you think about this, you begin to think about what was Noah's life like. It was unbelievable. It was a horror. Yeah. It was an absolute horror. Kind of like the plot too, right? In a different was, way. Yeah. Well, but Noah probably used those giants to help build that boat. Who? Yeah. <laughs> it, it, maybe. Because it was one massive. Yeah. Taking, At any rate. <laughs> anyway. Do you think in '43 then? There will be giants again? Yes. There's going to be hybridization. Okay? There's going to be hybridization. And interestingly enough, you see that the hybridization, you see the hybridization which God stifles in Genesis 6 restarts in Genesis 9 and 10. We're not there yet. We're not there yet. But how does it restart? Because this guy shows up Named, no, this guy shows up in Genesis 9 and 10, named Nimrod. Nimrod. And what does he do? It says, he became a Giborim, it says in the Hebrew. That's what it says. So now he becomes a Giborim, and the process in a limited way starts over again. And in the rest of the Old Testament, you see these groups of these Anakim and Raphaim and Zenzuman that are all called giants that, of course, plague Israel all the way to the time of David. Now, they That's never... That's we talked about it. Today. Yes. Pardon? Isn't that what we talked about it today? Um, that we don't know, the Bible doesn't say exactly how, but, but part of, the, of those evil entities they were able to escape. Yeah, it says in Genesis 6, if you remember, it says, let me read it. 
makes a very interesting statement that you have to keep in mind. And that is, well, let me read four and five again to you out loud, okay? The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and it says, and also afterward. So somehow, even though the major infection is controlled, a minor infection breaks out later, okay? It never becomes to the level of the first major infection because the 200 fallen angels that started all this are locked away, so they can't play the game again. So it never has the, it never becomes as big as it was the first time. Okay, and then it also says, when the sons of God, of course, came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them, these were the mighty men, Gibarim, those, uh, the men, uh, the old, the mighty men of old, the men of renown. So, now. Where did you get 200? In the book of Enoch, it, it, oh, tells us, book of Enoch. it tells us how many of them came down and what they did. And they just completely corrupted the human race at that point. They taught them all kinds of horrible things. They taught them occult practices. They taught them metallurgy to make instruments of war. They taught them about strategies of warfare and killing each other. They, they, they produced a, a bizarre pharmacology. I mean, it's very interesting. If you, if you want to take the time to read the book of Enoch, to see what they actually did, you know? Makeup. Also. Inter that's true. They, they created makeup for women. Oh, okay. So, in verse 43 and verse 44, it implies that the offspring... Uh, again, are, are a, a hybridization, and that some type of transhumanist satanic strategy will occur in the future that will have a similar element to what happened in Genesis 6. This is what Jesus is telling us in Matthew 24. If you start to read, if you spend any time on transhumanism, we're in serious danger right now because there are so many places that are making so many hybrids that it's unbelievable. AI is now being combined, artificial intelligence is now being combined in human brains and they're making hybrids of AI humans. They're making, uh, they're making AI soul super soldiers. Okay, they're making they're making stuff that we will never be able to control. Scientists in the world okay. across smart people. the smart people. It's occurring in the major countries. It's occurring under DARPA in our country. It's occurring in China. It's occurring in Russia. Everyone's doing it. They're doing it at a prolific rate right now. There's there's hundreds of articles you can read about this. Soros funding that? Of course, he's so, he name anything that Soros isn't funding, you know, you know. It's a legitimate question. I know, you know, because he's the ultimate globalist. He isn't funding anything in Russia because it doesn't make any sense. That's true. They, that's right. My, Rush, they, they, no, Russians. I read, I read his biography. Yeah, Russians have said that he, if he dares step foot in their country. He tried once, and then it was extremely non-profitable. Yeah. So, at any rate, where is he now? Do you know? Everywhere. I'm not certain where he lives. I'm certain how many places he lives. He's not in the United States. No. He can't go back, of course, to Hungary. Hung yeah, Hungary is where, yeah, Hungary is where he was born. Because, of course, he's a war criminal in Hungary. You know why? Yeah. Because he was part of the Nazi party in Hungary. He was an accountant. How old is he? He's 80 something. 80, okay. 88, yeah. 87. Yeah. And you better believe he's leaving his money to some evil people. Of course. Well, he's got sons. Mm -hmm. You know. And, and isn't, the, isn't he Jewish? Jewish? I think he is partly Jewish. Okay. Now, let's finish this. Let's finish this off. Okay. You talking about Soros? No. <laughs> that would be nice to finish him off, but that's not my job, so. So let's go to verse 44 in Daniel 2, and let's see how this all kind of comes out. 
in the days of those kings, these ten, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed, and that kingdom will not be left to, for another people. In other words, there's no one that's going to take it over. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, but it itself will endure forever. What, we're gonna, what do we call that kingdom? We call it, exactly, the millennial thousand-year reign of Christ on the earth. He will set up that last kingdom, and all, all nations will be under its, his control. And there will not be a nation that will overcome it. Okay? It will become permanent in, for a thousand years and then change into, of course, another form of kingdom uh, in the new, new, new heavens, new earth, and new Jerusalem. So it says that this crushing stone grows and becomes a giant mountain. We see that in Daniel 2, verse 35. It fills the whole earth, and it will never be destroyed by any kingdom. And as we said, this is the millennial rule of Christ. Now, there's some interesting things about the stone. And why don't we look at them for just a second. Turn to Psalm 118, verse 22. Psalm 118. We'll see if I have my reference right here. Twenty-two. There's too many pages in the Psalms. <laughs> There's one of them. 150 Psalms. Mm -hmm. Okay, so 118, Psalm 118, verse 22. It says, The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. It says, This is the Lord's doing and is marvelous in our eyes. And in this day which the Lord has made, we will rejoice and be glad. So in other words... Even though Messiah was meant to be the foundation all along, the Jews rejected him as the cornerstone, correct? But he will be the cornerstone. But he will be the cornerstone, okay? Uh, look also at, um, go, go forward to Isaiah 8.14 from Psalms. 8.14. I think I have this right. Okay. Then it says, again, it's talking about, well, let's start at 13. It is the Lord of hosts who you should regard as holy, and he shall be your fear, and he shall be your dread, and he shall become a sanctuary both to both houses of Israel, a stone to strike and a rock to stumble over. See, that was Jesus' first ministry on earth. He was the stone that the Jews stumbled over. They couldn't accept him as Messiah. They couldn't see how he fit into the Old Testament system. They couldn't see as the fulfillment of all the things that they did and their religious rites, and they rejected him. Okay, But, of course, he becomes a snare and a trap for the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and many will stumble over him. Then they will fall and become broken. They will even be snared and caught. So that's what happens to the stone the first time. Then in, I will turn to Isaiah 28, 16. From Isaiah 8, go to 28. Verse 16. Therefore thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am laying a, in Zion that is, Mount Moriah, Zion, in Jerusalem, a stone, a tested stone, a costly cornerstone. Who would that be? Christ. Christ, the costly cornerstone. Why does he say costly cornerstone? It cost him his life. Exactly. It cost the father his son's life mm -hmm. to become the cornerstone. Okay? A costly cornerstone for the foundation, firmly placed, and he who believes in it will not be disturbed. Okay? And, and, of course, what will eventually come from him as Messiah? When he comes back, I will make justice the measuring line, righteousness the level. Then, and Hale you know, goes on and on about then talking about the millennial kingdom. So,
So, when Christ, Christ returns in, that, in Revelation 19, he will be that striking stone which sub, subjugates all the nations. And that, of course, uh, is seen, again, in verses 44 and 45 of Daniel 2. Now, let's finish this. The final verses, 46 through 49. Let's read them, Daniel 2. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face and did homage to Daniel, gave orders to present him an offering and, and fragrant incense. The king answered Daniel and said, Surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and the revealer of mysteries, since you've been able to reveal this mystery. Then the king promoted Daniel and gave him many great gifts, and he made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and a chief prefect over the wise men of Babylon. And Daniel made request to the king, and he appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over administration of the province of Babylon while Daniel was in the king's court. So. And Daniel was young. Yes. Oh, he'd only been there. He was probably at this point Couple, 20 now. Remember, he went through his three-year. Yeah. And then it was a couple years after that. He's probably 20, 21 years old when this happens, approximately. Mm -hmm. Okay. So and the other guys are older, and they don't like it. Yeah. The, yeah. Right. The 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 other administrators in the court. Felt the, the, well, like Elon Musk and then saying a few things with regard to the government and everybody else. Yeah. So the king was blown away by hearing the dream and its interpretation. He sees in this the absolute superiority of Daniel's God versus the Babylonian gods. Interestingly enough, the king falls to the floor in awe and orders incense and offerings to be made to Daniel, which demonstrates the king doesn't quite get it all. Because Daniel's tried to clearly make the case, this is not my doing. This is God's doing. Okay, this is God's answer to you. This is God's vision and dream he gave you, not mine. Now, because the king had promised gifts and honors to anyone who could solve the mystery, remember that in the beginning of the chapter there? Uh, Daniel was promoted to head administrator to the province in which the city of Babylon resides. And now, I think this is very interesting. And I'll tell you why I think it's interesting. Remember, Daniel comes in the first wave of exiles. But there's two more waves to come. And I think God promotes him to put him in a position to take care of the ones that are coming in the next number of years. So, again, God does his strategy here. And he's got Israel in his hand. Right? Uh, so, and again, finally... True to the humble nature of Daniel, he asked for promotion of his friends to assist him in the administration, not forgetting that it was their prayers with his prayers that caused God to be moved for Daniel to have the interpretation and to see the vision. Question so, there, yes. Like, about this. In uh, verse uh, 36, it says, This was the dream. Now, we will tell this interpretation before the king. Mm -hmm. Why we? Because he and his body? It could be. It could be that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were there with him when he went into the king's presence. Because to, he answered the prayer. Oh, they, they, had, they had one serious, serious prayer session that yeah, night. Yeah. It was either God gives them the answer or... So he, in some manner, acknowledges God. And then you go to chapter... You, you mean Nebuchadnezzar? Yeah, Nebuchadnezzar. To the extent he does. I know, but then you go to chapter 3. What was the time period between 2 and 3? In other words, he acknowledges God, and then we go to the image and wanting them to worship the image. I mean, was there a time frame? Or there was obviously some... Not get it. There were some time frame, I believe, but I'm not sure. I'm going to have to look more carefully to see if I can determine what it might have been. Right off the top of my head, I don't know. But you're right. Chapter 3 is that, you know, 
Nebuchadnezzar goes back to being full of himself. And then chapter 4 is his final humbling, where God says, buddy, you're not getting this, okay? And then humbles him for seven years. And then finally, after that, he goes, okay, (laughs) I believe now in the God of heaven. And he talks about what he learned and the humility. He repented. I think it's very possible we're going to see Nebuchadnezzar in heaven based on chapter 4. That would be fun. Okay? So at any rate, um, so let's go ahead and uh, uh, we'll stop right now, and next week we will take up chapter 3.